Okay. Oh, you can see the. There we go. Okay, cool. So we are going to talk about the brain. I know I've been calling this the brain unit. It's obviously more than that, but we're going to actually talk about the structure and the pieces more so than the hand waving I've already done. Now again, before I get too more too deeply into this, and I already apologize for the um the AC. I try and edit it out, but it's really hard to tell if it's actually edited out because usually it's running, so I can't tell if it's the recordings or my app, uh, the in real life version of the streaming. But anyway, uh, welcome back. Uh, we're talking about the brain. So yeah, and in this lecture, while well, I'm going to talk to you about the different brain pieces and some of the evidence we have to kind of relate the brain to personality and the different structural aspects. I'm not going to give you a picture of the brain and ask you to label it mm -mm. because uh, I couldn't do that. That's why you will see me putting up the same brain pieces over and over and over, the same diagram. That's for me, not so much for you. I mean, it's help, hopefully helpful to you, but I'm putting it in there for me. Because I, I always have to look up which brain parts are which. Except for the corpus callosum. That's the, the splitty happy piece. Um, because I did a fun activity on it. When I was like 10. Uh, but you can ask me about it during office hours. Okay. So, yeah. Brain. Remember this? Everybody has one. Even if it doesn't feel like it, everybody does have one. And... So I'm going to remind you of these, the, the kind of the big chunks. I know I talked about them, but I just wanted to do that. So, you know, so yeah, um, hypothalamus is connected to just about everything else. It secretes several hormones that we'll talk about in a different unit or a different chunk of this module. Um, but yeah, hypothalamus, hormone switch. Amygdala is important for its role in emotion. And we are going to talk about that one a lot in my five slides of mine. Next, hippocampus. This one's important for processing memories. She's got not the hypothalamus, the hippocampus. Cortex, the wrinkly part of your brain. All the stuff you see is the outer layer. The neocortex is the outer layer's outer layer. Um, it's the most distinctive part. It's the super wrinkly part. It creates more surface area. Last, frontal cortex. This is that large frontal lobe thing right here. Maybe I will edit out that if you want to, although I didn't do it again. Anyway, <laughs> um, but yeah, so the frontal cortex, it's large. It's it seems to be really crucial to uniquely human aspects of cognition, such as planning ahead, anticipation, of consequences and emotional experiences this seems to be the, one of the big set like big clear special aspects now you do need a lot of your brain to function but uh just to like live and breathe and things but the frontal cortex is kind of a there's the frontal lobe that whole front chunk of your head it's very important um, just for being human and all those like thoughts, feelings, and even the planning of those behaviors. Don't let let me just be quiet. Oh, stop that! Okay, sorry. There's the button, the little like screen capture tooly thing, is blocking the the next button. All right, so let's start with the amygdala. Uh, this links perceptions and thoughts with emotional memory. It seems to have a pretty strong role in negative emotions, anger and fear especially. Now this activates, like, it lights up for sh in people who are shy, so those are lower levels of extroversion. Um, and when they're shown, kind of, when those shy people are, let me actually finish this. So they light up for shy people when they're shown pictures of strangers. Now, also, uh, people with anxiety disorders tend to have the amygdala, like, on, like, a lot. It seems to definitely have a role in, um, anxiety, 
Now, it does also have a role in positive emotions, so uh, social... Why is there... Sorry. Okay, there is no word after that. So the, the tripod blocks. Uh, social attraction and sexual responses, so um, it has some aspect. There's, I know more about the negative emotionality pieces than the positive emotionality, but they both, they both are involved. And there definitely seems to be a role in assessing whether a stimulus, so like any, any unit of anything you like zoom in, focus in on, whether that stimulus is threatening or rewarding. So there's some evaluation here. So I guess it makes sense that it was anxiety is in there, like because threat assessment and anxiety are walk hand in hand. Okay, so what are the relevant traits? And here I'm going to really encourage you to think about um, this in oh, all of these things. Okay, so sorry about that. Not that on the screen, but it's on the screen. So. So here are the uh, relevant traits to the amygdala, and one thing I'd really encourage you to do in this kind of whole brain unit here is really think about integrating in or fusing in the various relevant traits that I've got right here on the slide already to um, into the big five and linking them like integrating your knowledge and kind of like plopping all this stuff straight into the big five instead of trying to remember like anxiety, fearfulness, sociability, sexuality, and optimism. Instead, if you break it down into extroversion and neuroticism with special, and once you do that, it really helps. Now, obviously within neuroticism, it's the, the specific traits that seem to be related to it are anxiety and fearfulness, while for positive emotionality, so extroversion, you've got both optimism and sociability and sexuality kind of goes in there too kind of um but so that's one way to like really help you kind of integrate because it's a lot of knowledge that you're plopping into it so yeah i went too fast um but yes yeah, so enough about that so the relevant traits to the amygdala are anxiety and fearfulness sociability sexuality Optimism, and these link into extroversion and neuroticism. Yes, I realize I just said that and repeated it, but it's going to be helpful. Very unsettling. Helpful. So it's also very relevant to motivation. Now, there's some controversy about the amygdala um, because it is often attributed, or at least strongly associated, with the Whitman murders uh, at the University of Texas, Austin. In 1966, uh, the tower, or this tower, I keep always wanting to call it the tower, but it's tower, is this really great documentary that gives a lot of detail about, and it's an animated one. It's not like, but you, it, it works. It, it really does. Um, tower that I saw on Netflix back in the day. I've given some links in the, the modules. If you want to just access it. But I've I've also included the um, trailer. But let me let me back up and talk to you about why this is helpful. So Charles Whitman murdered uh, a lot of people, and he like got a sniper rifle and went up to the tower at UT Austin and gunned him down. It's it's not it it's a dark documentary. It's a obviously a horrible crime and he let's see uh, Whitman murdered his wife his mother um, himself and um, 14 others and so there's why is this relevant so afterwards after he died they dis they autopsied him and they found a malig malignant tumor next to his amygdala which there's been a lot of speculation that this may have caused his motivation to murder all those people. And, but, mm, I, because uh, there doesn't seem to be a really clear motive and uh, on why he did it. There's some writings, but it seems to be more like a lot of, just, I, I realize I'm, I'm kind of babbling I really encourage you to check out this film or the documentary or 
anything related to this. It's pretty dark, but the, my point that I'm trying to make is that there's a con there's a very controversial link, uh, and that's extremely controversial about how this tumor that was near his amygdala that they found afterwards caused all of these crimes. I'm I'm of the opinion that um sure that it could have contributed, sure. But at the end of the day the amygdala didn't kill those people. It didn't. It's a little lump like in, in your brain. Uh Whitman did. And sure it probably contributed in it possibly contributed in some way. We'll never really know. Um but fully blaming the tumor, I, 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 I just can't get behind kind of absolving this guy of murder and kind of writing it off as, oh, well, the tumor did it. Wait, I mean, because it didn't do it. He, he did it. It's that, so yeah, this is, it's a mixed opinion, sure. Obviously, there's a lot of nuance. Again, I encourage you, documentary. Also, not sponsored, uh, but I'm happy to endorse this film. It's really good. But that's one of the kind of, it's usually a go-to example for uh, evidence that, like, brains, like, all, like when you alter brain structure, you alter personnel, because obviously he wasn't a serial murderer before this. Um... But, okay, now I'm rambling. I, I know. So, I'm always hesitant when something is like, they make a really strong causal claim. I'll, I'll concede it's probably a mitigating factor. I am not, and I didn't dissect his brain. I am not an expert in the amygdala or motivation or murderers. But I am a pretty good expert in causal inference. And we don't have enough evidence to make a causal claim. We don't. We don't have any kind of counter evidence. Cool. So I've uh, re-sliced up this lecture. I wasn't really happy with the structure. I just wasn't. Um, so, yeah. It's going to look a little choppy. I apologize. But yeah, so we just talked about the something, and now we're going to talk about the anterior um, cingulate, which I swear I can, go, I can pronounce. Yeah, so the anterior cingulate. So this, this little chunk of brain um, is important for experiencing emotion. It uh, actually works kind of as a counterbalance to the amygdala, or it's not like 100%, but at least it inhibits the amygdala. And it seems to be related to controlling emotional responses and behavioral impulses, which is, again, one reason why Charles Whitman gets talked about a lot in this area, because uh, the tumor, the theory is that this tumor interfered with that uh, anterior cingulate amygdala circuit. And this also has uh, possible implications for extroversion and neuroticism. The, the idea is that, um, excuse me, my uh, script to keep me on task is right, right where you camera are. So possible implications for neuroticism and extroversion. Uh, there's, oh, there's no word there. Okay, so it's stronger response for positive and neutral words among extroverts compared to introverts. And um, there seems to be more activity among those with higher neuroticism when stimuli don't match what their expectations are. So this mismatch, there's this idea that that triggers, or at least, negative emotionality and that negative emotionality is associated or those negative emotions tend to be more salient with uh people high on neuroticism on occasion you'll see in the book they say neurotics 
I don't really like that term because it's got this Freudian bent and mm, we'll talk more about that in a future video. Well, I'll talk about it and you'll experience that talking. But yeah, so that's the interior cingulate. Uh, the book goes into a ton more detail. I really encourage you to like use the book for this this chapter um, just because it it gives lots of sources, it gives lots more detail, and there's some really, it's very helpful. So, um, again, more brain. Uh, so the amygdala is here, cingulate is somewhere in here. Parent, oh, there it is, I lied, right there. Um, but yeah, so, brain, all this stuff. Now, I've sliced this up more, and so you're going to see me jump around in different jackets uh, just because I realized that lots of slices got very long, um, and my goal is to keep these at ideally under 20 minutes, but they, they seem to go a little longer, and so I found some slices to put in. So next time I'm going to talk about the frontal lobe and Phineas Gage. Now, if we were in person, I would be bringing in some props to illustrate how ginormous the spike is. It's three feet long. A little more than three feet. It like goes up to my armpit when I'm standing. Not that you've ever got any sense of how tall I am, but I'm decently, I'm, I'm slightly above average. But yeah, so next time Phineas Gage in the frontal lobe. We're going to go into lots of depth, and uh, this is one of my more favorite little, like, fun historical romps. But again, all this stuff, really encourage you to, like, touch base with the book, um, just so you can get a more uh, broad uh, breath. Okay, so yeah, that's it for this very weirdly sliced up module. Um, I'll see you in the next one. Oh yeah, this is what we're doing. Give me slice out. Oh, there we go. I'm gone. Ugh.